We've been waiting for a long time for this to happen. I love that the Global Methodist Conference started with this song of praise because it tells our part of God's story from the birth of Jesus Christ to the birth of the church and the spread of the gospel. If we look back at God's plans and how they've unfolded through the ages, we cannot help but notice one thing. I want you to pay attention. That the circle of those who were invited into God's presence and his kingdom is ever widening. Think about it. From Abraham and his descendants to the nation of Israel, to all those around the world who would hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself gave his disciples that same vision in Acts 1, that the gospel would spread from a small place, right? It would spread from Jerusalem, it would move into the country of Judea, it would move into neighboring countries, Samaria, and on out into the world. His invitation is ever-widening, ever-expanding. Now, as we listen to Revelation 6, and for those of you who are here for the first time, you walked into something. <laughs> We've been studying Revelation. <laughs> As we prepare to hear Revelation 6, let's hear it listening for that understanding. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror built, bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice coming, like a voice among the four living creatures saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures say, come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Haiti was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord? holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drops from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and we believe it. Let's pause for just a moment and consider what you've heard. I can hear your thoughts. <laughs> How
how is that an invitation? And for those of you who are pre-tribulation rapturous, you're thinking, we're not going to be here anyway. Why do I need to hear this? <laughs> but what if we are? What if God has written down these things for us so that when they happen, we'll understand his purposes and, as his people, know how to cooperate with him in them? Revelation 6 gives us a long view of what's going to happen during that time called the tribulation when the world is dominated by the one called the Antichrist. As we continue reading Revelation, the things described here in chapter 6, wars, plagues, famine, earthquakes, devastation on the earth, those things are going to grow in ever-increasing frequency and they're going to grow in magnitude. What's going on? Why is it happening, and how, then, should we respond? Those are the questions we're going to deal with today. Perhaps there's a clue in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, which Paul writes to the church at Corinth, a church much like us, and he says, pay attention to those things that have happened in Israel's history. This is why they were written down as warnings and example, listen, for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. There's something back there that we need to look at then as we consider these words in Revelation because they describe the fulfillment of the ages, don't they? Yes. This is where you say yes, or I can go back and say it again. I'll be glad to. <laughs> but dinner's waiting. <laughs> where do we read anything like that in the Old Testament? Um, where are there ever increasing devastations that grow in magnitude? You know this answer. It would happen in the book of Exodus. What was God doing? He's redeeming his people, leading them out of save, slavery. How did he do it? Through a deliverer, sending Moses, who was himself a Hebrew. So he's related to those people that God sent to set, him free, to set free, right? What's his message to Pharaoh? Let my people go. Let my people go. To accomplish that, he sent a series of ever-increasing plagues, some of which his people had to go through, some of which they just fell on those that had kept them in bondage. But each of those plagues had to do with one of Egypt's gods. So as God set his people free... He was also proving that he was more powerful than any other god. Now, if you don't remember where it is, just stick in your notes, Exodus 12, 12, and you can go back and find that. But this calls for thought. How is that like what we're reading in Revelation 6? When we read in, when, pardon me, when we read Revelation 5 a couple of weeks ago, we found out that Jesus had just re-entered heaven's throne room, Right? having bought back, redeemed the world and its people by what? What was the cost? By his blood. By his blood. That was the price of the title deed to earth, right? Yes. That deed had been stolen by a usurper, one to whom it did not belong, yes. one whom Jesus identified before he died as the ruler of the world, one of whom John said the whole world is under his sway, and Paul wrote that he was the little g God of this age. Who is that? It's Satan. But as you will recall, with the turning of the page to Revelation 5, that new age began. The price having been paid, Satan no longer has power. He is now a defeated enemy. But think about what has happened on earth. Because we know it's happened in, in heaven, right? But on earth, he is still occupying what rightfully belongs to Jesus the power systems of the world are still guided by his influence, as are many of the world's religious systems. And these people that Jesus loves are in bondage to those systems. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You see how it starts to relate to Exodus. Yeah. All right. Here's my premise. In Revelation 6, Jesus, our deliverer, who became like us, right, now begins opening this deed with its seven seals. As they're opened, he is making war on the power systems and religious systems that keep his people in bondage. 
And we're going to see that more and more clearly, especially in Revelation 17 and 18. If you want a glimpse, it'd be a good place to do some devotional reading this next week. <laughs> I do realize this is a stretch because we haven't talked about those things a lot, have we? We haven't dealt with prophecy nearly as much as we probably should have. Um, is there anything in prophecy then that agrees with that premise? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. And it actually has to do with those horses. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open them to Zechariah 1. It's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew there that you can use. Zechariah 1. While you're finding it, these first few chapters of Zechariah describe a series of six visions, and in two of them, these horses appear. The first vision is in chapter 1, Zechariah 1, verse 8. And the horses described there are white, well, that should sound familiar. One's red, hmm, that should sound familiar. And one is brown, and Zechariah has the same question you do. He doesn't know what he's looking at. So he asked the angel, who was also in that vision, what are these? And the angel responds in verse 10, they're the ones, what? Whom the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth, right? Yes. Are you in Zechariah 1? Okay, you're going to want to follow along because we're going to go several places today. So these are angelic messengers sent by God. What did they find? It's in verse 11. They report back to the angel of the Lord who was also in that vision. Well, we've gone through the whole world and it's at rest and it's at peace. But the angel of the Lord knows that all are not at rest and peace. Somebody is not. And so he asks a question that should sound very familiar to you. Lord Almighty, how long? Where have you heard that before? Well, that would be Revelation 6. And he wants to know what God is going to do about the situation that exists. Because while the whole world is at peace, God's people are not. They have not been. For 70 years, that's the period of time during which they were in exile. But even now that they're back in their own homeland, they're still in bad shape. Hearing what these messengers who have gone throughout the whole earth find, he says, I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very angry with the nations that feel secure, implying that though they feel secure, they're really not. He says, I was only a little angry, but they added to the calamity. Here's the back story. You know this. Here God refers to the fact that Israel was sent into exile because she began to serve other gods, right? You know this. And if you remember your Old Testament history, God used other nations to carry out that judgment against her, Assyria, Babylon, and so on. But these nations who attacked Israel did more, they went further than God allowed in harming his people. And as a result, while the world is at peace, they're not at peace. And I want you to notice something. That matters greatly to God, that his people are not at peace. Does that make sense to you? Okay, that should, call, that should give you cause to rejoice. Um, as you read the rest of that first vision, God announces that he intends to do good for his people. Look on over to Zechariah 2, verse 8. This is just a caveat. He reminds his people Israel there that whoever touches them touches the apple of his eye. And he'll bring judgment upon those who do, just as he did upon Egypt. I'm just going to let that sit there for a moment. We need to be careful in our attitude toward Israel. And now turn on over to Zechariah 6. There's that second vision regarding the horses. Zechariah 6, verse 1, tells us they're coming out from between mountains of bronze. Now, bronze is a sign of judgment, and so justice is about to fall. 
Verses 5 and 6 tell us exactly who these horses are and who sent them. This should sound familiar. They're the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. And so these are angelic messengers. And this time when God sends them out is to mete out judgment. So what we're seeing in Zechariah is God's judgment. Does that make sense to you? What we're seeing in Revelation 6 then is God's judgment. Don't want to leave doubt about it. Are there other places in prophecy that give us more information about this passage? Yes. Yes. Let's go to a couple. Don't turn to this one. Isaiah 13, among many others, tells us that one day God's wrath is going to fall on the nations of the world. Psalm 2 tells us why, and you may want to write these down so you can go back and look. Because the people of the world have chosen their own king, who will that be? It'll be the Antichrist. And they refuse to accept God, God's choice, who is Jesus Christ, right? All right, so we're going to see this played out as all the nations at the instigation of the Antichrist gather against Jesus' coming in Revelation 19. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples what will happen just before he returns to take over as king. And even though it's written in the New Testament, that too is prophecy. That whole sequence of events is described in Matthew 24, and it describes perfectly what we just read in Revelation 6, verses 1 through 11. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be famines and earthquakes. There's going to be great persecution, right? It's right there in Matthew 24 too. And in Isaiah 34, the Lord explains what will happen as his wrath falls. This should sound familiar because you've heard it before. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved. The heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the, vi from the fig tree. Isaiah 2.19 explains the fear that will fall on people. Listen. People will flee to caves in the rocks and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Well, we've heard that before. <laughs> That's in prophecy. And so what we're seeing in Revelation is that poured out, right? Yes. Okay. Can you go just a little further? Sure. Because there's good stuff coming. All right, um, Isaiah 2.20, and you may want to turn over there because I, th I think it would be helpful for you to see that. Isaiah 2, verse 20. Uh, there it describes the result of all of these judgments that are going to come upon the earth. Isaiah 2.20 says they're going to throw away their idols. All of those things that people have have worshipped their self-sufficiency, the systems that they have set in place, the money that they have amassed, none of those things can save them and they will recognize it in that day. Now, if I was them, what would I do? I would turn to God, okay? And, and then we find out in Isaiah 2, 22, that that's actually the desired outcome of it. God says to so stop trusting in man, who has but a breath in his nostrils of what account is he? Because for those under the rule by then of the Antichrist who will come, appearing to bring hope, right, and a temporary peace, this is a warning not to be taken in. Because our hope does not lie in the work nor in the schemes of man. Where does our hope lie? It lies in God. As we come near to that election, that is a good thing to remember, right? Yes. Amen or ouch. So there are warnings and examples from Israel's past. There's prophecy that corroborates what God is going to do, what he is indeed doing in Revelation 6. So we know what's going on as we read this, don't we? Yes. All right. The only question remains then, how do we respond if we're still here? during this time. Number one, remember God's purposes. In these judgments, he's making war on an oppressor and he is setting captives 
free. Those who will hear and turn to him during this trial. And we're shown the amazing result. If you just want to see some good news, look at Revelation 7 just for a moment. As Revelation 7 describes a great multitude of believers who have come out of this time of, of tribulation and now because they have come to believe, they're going to spend eternity with the Lord and the number of them is so great that they can't even be counted. Somebody ought to be shouting hallelujah at that point. Yes! Trials have a way of changing our focus, don't they? And if we're here, what an opportunity we will have to come alongside, to speak words of hope in the Lord, amen? I cannot help but wonder if the devastation of the floods around us is a little like a dress rehearsal, and I'm not saying that's part of the tribulation, but what an opportunity we have in this time to come alongside, to speak words of hope in God, to show his love and care. Some of you may be meant to go and help physically. Some of us might not be able to go, but I hope we'll find a way to help as a church. That would be a conversation worth having, wouldn't it? Somebody ought to start that. Maybe it's got to come from missions. Maybe it's going to come from somebody else. But I think we need to have that conversation. Lord, in your mercy, because there are people hurting and in need of the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Second, do not fear. Trust in what God is doing and in his power to bring it to completion. If you think back to what God was doing um, in Israel, one of the biggest problems Israel faced as she walked through that process of being delivered was that she did not trust in God's work on her behalf nor in his power to provide whatever was necessary. What was the outcome? You know it as a result. Every trouble that they faced Every need that arose caused her to question God. And it threw her into confusion and led her into rebellion against God. There's a warning and example from history that we do not have to step into. Amen? All right, Jesus has told us what is to come so that we will not be blindsided by it. He's warned us not to be deceived in the midst of those things. Rather, he has said, when you see those things happening, keep watch. Remain faithful. And we can trust his word because we've seen God's plans accomplished in Jesus Christ, haven't we? Because yes. there was a time when we were waiting in darkness without hope, without light, without God. And God sent his son to save us out of his great mercy. His coming was a fulfillment then of the law and the prophets, something he had already purposed to do, that is to invite us into his presence and his kingdom, an eternal one, right? And as he has already proven, he is faithful to bring to completion what he has begun. And there are many more throughout the world to be invited, especially in times of trouble as his plans unfold. Many today, without hope, without light. So let's be ready to run into those places carrying the message and the hope of Jesus Christ. And may the prophets indeed be fulfilled. May there be a multitude in heaven because of the words of hope that you have spoken. Amen. 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 Let's pray. <laughs> Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Holy Spirit. Three in one. God of glory, majesty, Praise forever to the King of Kings. Lord, we have the privilege because you've called us, you've set us in this place. You've called us by name and you've called us yours. Oh, but God, there are many who do not yet know you and we may face those times when we have the privilege of telling them who you are and what you have done for us. So place your words in our mouths, a testimony 
on our lips. God, as we see these times coming, help us to look up because our redemption is coming. You are our redemption. You are our hope. You are the King of Kings. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. Because those words are sobering, we know that we are going to face hard times. And yet, we face them with the hope of Jesus Christ. And so even though the earth shake, we can be at his peace, right? That's right. We're going to close this morning with it as well.